giving our money, arms, prestige to various uh, groups trying to overthrow this or that government around the world. We probably got to know who they are and what their agenda is. And often we don't. You're seeing it right now in Syria. I'm not defending the Assad regime. I'm merely saying just because Bashar Assad is a bad guy doesn't mean the people who oppose him are good guys. And so we should pause before we start sending him weapons. But so often we don't. We just weigh in like we know what we're doing. Um, and the, the blowback and the unintended consequences are sometimes profound, as you know. And as you know, because you wrote about this last year, now they're openly in the Washington Post saying, oh, my God, Al-Qaeda got all these weapons. They may attack Europe with them. It's incredible. So, so the weapons out of Benghazi into Syria are already leaking all over the place. And we have a right to know that, by the way. I mean, uh, you know, half of what the government does seems sometimes like it's a classified. And if we're arming a rebel group in Syria, you know, maybe all the details shouldn't be public, but that basic fact ought to be public, and it's not. You know, they, they keep it from us. And I. What do you make of the new Washington Post article out today where the Al-Qaeda rebels with Al-Qaeda flags are chopping people's hands off because they don't follow the religious rules? Uh, and it says the extremist Syrian group deemed too radical even for Al-Qaeda. Well, wait, they have Al-Qaeda flags. They have the Wahhabist flags uh, are now ch chopping people's hands off. Uh, for not joining them. I mean, Look, in the, they're, they're savages, obviously. In the end, it seems to me our interest in other countries is stability. And so, you know, for all the talk, the, I mean, the irony is, for example, in Egypt, we were, the Obama administration was talking about, you know, the right of the Egyptian people to determine their own future and to be free. So we, in effect, backed the overthrow of Mubarak. A year and a half, two years later, the people of Egypt are less free. The Islamists have more power. So, again, the paradox is sometimes as we pursue liberation in the rest of the world, we wind up abetting tyranny. And so we should just, like, be humble. Understand what you don't understand. Understand that there are always consequences you can't foresee. Sometimes it's better just to, you know, don't just do something. Stand there. Restraint is called for. And no one ever says that out loud because you sound weak when you say it, but it's true. Well, saber rattling with Iran, all the numbers show, props up the mullahs. Exactly. And then saber rattling with Putin actually strengthens his position in Russia. And I just don't see how the State Department could be involved in, in giving top ministerial jobs in western Ukraine now in Kiev uh, to known neo-Nazis. Well, look, uh, Cuba is the perfect example. I hate Fidel Castro and his brother Raul. I think communism is the most evil system ever devised. I, I truly hated the Soviet Union. I'm not defending Cuba at all. My only point is our embargo against Cuba clearly allowed Fidel to stay in power longer. So, you know, think through what you want the end result to be and then, you know, do wise things in order to bring it about. I mean, you can wind up helping people by attacking them, I guess, is the obvious point. I want to get into GOP and the whole libertarian movement, the Tea Party and the battle uh, that's going on there. Uh, but uh, one of your compadres from the Daily Caller uh, uh, was here and he said that we ought to bring up the point, which is a really good question, I didn't think to ask, about how Wall Street is so behind Obama and how the Republicans are behind Obama, uh, the leadership is not wanting to repeal Obamacare. What do you think is behind that? Because that's what's making the Tea Party so upset. Well, there's been a huge shift in American culture and American politics that no one ever, people rarely mention, and that is that rich people now vote Democrat. Rich people and poor people vote Democrat. This is a broad generalization, but it's generally true, and everyone else uh, doesn't. And so Wall Street absolutely is responsible uh, for Obama's election, or partly responsible in 08. They supported him. They financed his campaign, even to some extent in 2012. And they are united. Wall Street uh, is united with the Democratic Party and with some of the Republican leadership on the question of immigration. Low-skilled immigration obviously raises profits for some companies. It also brings in Democratic voters. And so there is this unspoken arrangement between the two parties, the leadership of the two parties, to back what they call immigration reform. Increasing, not, not just legalizing the 12 or 13 million illegal aliens here, but in bringing, in doubling the number of legal entrants, low-skilled labor into the country because it helps both the parties. I just don't think it helps middle-class Americans at all. And I don't think there's any evidence it does. But he's already by fiat legalizing most of the people and not deporting them. I saw that, uh, the, I think it was in the Daily Caller just the other day, that they've slashed uh, the number of people uh, in court that they're actually beating. You know what, let's skip this network break. This is too important. We're going to skip that break right there. I can do that occasionally. <laughs> because I'm on radio show. It sounds like fun. Well, no, it does cost the network money, but that's, you know, whatever we do it sometimes because I just want to keep talking about this. 
where do you see it all going? Because I see the elite in this country thinking short term about their profits instead of thinking long term about the integrity of the nation. I mean, this country's infrastructure, all of it is just rotting. And then government has this instinct to want to disenfranchise, get people on the dole, put them on welfare, cut their hours from 40 hours to 25 hours under Obamacare. Exactly. I mean, it really is cloward and pivot. Well, it doesn't make any sense at all from an economic point of view. You want immigration when you have a labor shortage. And we have the opposite of a labor shortage. We have persistent long-term double-digit unemployment. I don't care what the, the official numbers are. We have double-digit unemployment that's extended for, what, six years now, five and a half years. You can't tell me that we have a labor shortage. We have just the opposite. So why are we bringing in, why are we doubling the number of legal workers? Because they work cheaper. Now, that's great for the businesses that employ them, and I understand that. I'm not attacking business. I'm merely saying it's not so great for people who already live here. The U.S. government has a one job, only one job, and that's to look out for the interests and the safety of American citizens, not for people in Guatemala who want to come here, not for the you know striving masses around the world. It'd be nice if we could help them, but that's not our main job. Our main job is to watch out for people who are already here and citizens here, Americans. And that scheme, importing millions, literally doubling the number of legal workers here, chaffs Americans because it undercuts which is really, really simple. There's no defending that. Well, I agree with you, and the numbers are very clear. This is, isn't even really debatable if someone is educated about basic economics. Look at Switzerland. They don't let anybody in. Their money gains value, doesn't lose it, and they only let skilled people in, and they absolutely are the richest country in the world, highest standard of living, Versus here, as Ross Perot said, you bring in giant unskilled groups, it doesn't raise your country. It drives down the overall standard of living. We become like Guatemala or Nigeria. They don't become like us. Well, exactly. California, where I grew up in Southern California, California, when I was a child, I'm about to turn 45, was one of the richest states in the country. It had a great school system and had great infrastructure. And one of the and it was also, by the way, a pretty conservative state. It voted Republican in presidential campaigns. One of the reasons that all of the main reason all of that has changed, the schools have disintegrated. It's too crowded for the infrastructure that exists. Uh, and the state has moved dramatically left. Immigration. That's the reason the demographic balance of the state changed. It is more like Oaxaca than it used to be. I'm not attacking anybody. I like Mexican immigrants because they work hard and they don't beg and I'm not a bigot. But it doesn't change the fact. Does it change the fact that like 80 something percent vote to take my guns and, and until we're able to deprogram these people, they get here and they get the, you know, the welfare. They believe the Democratic Party is for them. The Republican Party leadership goes along with it. It is literally Game over, bring in an outside group to vote for Obamacare, to vote for socialism, to vote for gun control. That's why the Democrats are serious when they say they're going to turn Texas blue. They will. Well, they, They'll they, bring in 10 million illegals, and, th and, and now you got MSNBC saying my kids belong to them, and they will come and they will run my life. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And, and they are doing this with, uh, you know, the, the complicit support of the Republican leadership because— it benefits a small number of people. I am not, just to be totally clear, I'm not a conspiracy nut. I don't think this is a, a secret conspiracy. I think it's completely out in the open. The Chamber of Commerce is lobbying uh, for this immigration bill, and La Raza is lobbying for the immigration bill. And they have different aims, but they have the same goal, which is to increase the number uh, of immigrants who come here. And by the way, we're at the highest level um, per capita of immigration in the last 100 years. We have more foreign-born Americans than at any time in the last 100 years. We've absorbed an awful lot, more than a million It's a political takeover. For 50 years. And, and the people part of the takeover are going to have their prosperity destroyed. It's not like they're even taking over and they're going to win. They're taking over and it's going to be Oaxaca. Well, it's, it's awesome for rich people. I live in an affluent neighborhood in Washington, D.C. D.C. is the richest city in America. And immigration is great for us because it's good for business and it's awesome for people seeking inexpensive help. I mean, to be totally blunt with you. And so rich people benefit from immigration. But anybody who's not rich does not benefit from it. And so it is, in a way, an informal conspiracy against the middle. It's ordinary people do not benefit from it. They just don't. And when you, when you press advocates in this, well, how exactly does it work that you import labor when you have an excess amount of labor? Why does that help? And they'll say, well, because you expend the economy. Really, where has that worked in the United States? And they say, well, it's worked in Silicon Valley. Really, because Silicon Valley employs fewer people than it did 30 years ago. So I'm not attacking Silicon Valley. I'm merely saying that 
you know, the uh, current information and finance based economy we have does benefit people, but it benefits as a proportion of the population, a smaller number of people than the manufacturing economy we used to have. So Obama looks around and he's like, I'm upset about income inequality. Well, you know, you should be because you get an unstable country when you have dramatic disparities in income. But do you understand why we have it? We have it partly, maybe largely because of immigration. That's right. And of course, you know what La Raza stands for. The race. And my issue is, I look at the Democratic Party and the demographics, and I've always been nonpartisan. But you can see they're going to get rid of the Republican Party right now. They are making it commit suicide. The Republicans are, are absolutely helping in this. And I don't want to have a total one-party system. We already almost have this with these committee chairmen. But when you look at La Raza and Mecha and their slogans, for those inside our group, everything, for those outside the group, nothing. And you look at how the Democrats were anti-civil rights, anti-civil rights act, anti-voting rights, up until the Republicans beat them. And people like my grandfather ran for office in Texas and won, you know, as a Republican when nobody was a Republican in the state, you know, back in the 60s. And the Democrats went from being the Ku Klux Klan party of race with Senator Byrd and all them to literally going, okay, we're going to go race politic with the minorities, make them the majority. And so basically they went and started financing Metro La Raza all of the Ford Foundation. And that's why you have this new race-based system where we all have been conditioned as Republicans or as libertarians or as white people to be, oh my gosh, we're loving, you know, we're not racist. Yes, please, you know, uh, do whatever. I'm sorry, I'm white. And beat ourselves with whips on the head. And then meanwhile, the Democrats have just recreated the Ku Klux Klan movement, but they've done it with minorities. Yeah, there's a lot of truth in that. I wish there weren't. I mean, there's no question that the country is more race conscious than it was when I was a kid. I thought we were moving away. I hate segregation. Clarence Thomas said that and got demonized last week. But it's just it's just factually true. We went from my kids, I have four children, and they learn all about segregation. In fact, it's one of the few things I learned about in school. And how horrible it was. And I agree with them completely. The idea that the federal government would take sides based on race is immoral and horrifying. And I, and I always want to say them, but I never do because I don't want to upset them because they're too young. We do that now. The federal government takes sides and hands out spoils based on your skin color. It hasn't changed. In fact, it's become even more entrenched. What was once a tradition in the South and the law in Southern states is now national under the rubric of diversity. Here's the problem with it. Not only is it unfair, it also creates undue ethnic awareness, which you don't want, and it's going to create ethnic politics. And the problem with ethnic politics is it's inherently unreasonable. People hate each other. If you want that's Democrat big city oh, scary, politics man. where they break everybody. The Romans 2000 years exactly. ago controlled Rome where they broke into ethnic groups. We're just going back to the great but here's game. why you don't want it. Every other country has it. We've never had it. If you and I disagree on an issue, we can be mad at each other, but the issues get resolved, like they change, and we can become friends again. If we disagree on ethnic grounds, if we dislike each other because we're of different ethnicities, that never changes. Ethnic ethnicity is immutable. And it doesn't make it about actual issues, it makes it about skin color. And people become, by definition, unreasonable, irrational, in some cases violent over ethnic division. And you really want to stay, you want to downplay the importance of race and ethnicity, and we are accentuating it with this. Oh, Martin Luther King said, make it about what somebody does, what they stand for, not about what color they I'm are. I'm just saying they're playing with fire. I'm not even making a moral case here. because I, I could, because it is immoral, but leave that aside. An atheist could agree that it is dangerous to fuel this fire. It can get out of control. You, there isn't a- Oh, you're right, race stuff is like a religion. Oh man, but you don't want to mess with it. Because people become, people, I mean, it just can flare up. I've traveled to a lot of countries and covered, uh, covered a lot of conflict around the world. And the one thing almost every place I've ever been has in common, at its core, the conflict is an ethnic conflict. It, that is the case in Iraq, Sunni, Kurd, Shia. They hate each other, not because of what they believe, but because who they are. We don't want that here. Same thing in Egypt. Exactly. Same, same thing. thing in Ukraine. Uh, it, it's Catholic uh, Orthodox. It's, it's also Russian-Ukrainian. That's, that's why you're seeing what's happening in Crimea. Crimea is 70% Russia. Russian, ru ethnic Russians who are different from ethnic Ukrainians. They don't, the distinction seems minor to us. It's not minor to them. It's central to them. Well, that's right. And plus the Ukrainians ran into Russia during World War II and killed a bunch of Russians. Then vice versa, the Russians came in and well, killed them. And yeah, and Stalin starved half of Ukraine in 1938, the biggest famine in human history. So like, there's a lot that we don't perceive because to us, everyone's the same. They're all foreigners, but no, they break down along ethnic lines. You don't want that here. And we are, we're accelerating it. I want to ask you when we come back, uh, Tucker Carlson is with us at thedailycaller.com. You see his news featured at infowars.com, other big sites like drudgereport.com. I want to ask you when we come back though, where you see our future straight ahead.
And I want to talk about Hillary Clinton. You've got the 2016 bombshell. I mean, is it true that she's ill and is going to pull out, or they just know she's so unpopular they're going to claim for now that she's ill? And we're also going to look at a whole bunch of other issues, the imperial presidency, the future of the media. We're on.